Okay, I think we're getting close to starting. Um, uh, Jason and, and Anthony, uh, uh, you're welcome to come uh, join us uh, for the introduction, for do the big reveal of our guests. Hold on, <laughs> and I have to start recording, so hold on. All right. Welcome to the second installment of uh, the Queen's Podcast Lab Learning Series. Uh, I am joined by my colleagues, Jason Tuga. Jason, good to see you. Hi, Joe. Great to be here. Thank you. I'm and, very and excited that Anika and Jamie are here. Oh, it's a great, I'm, I'm super stoked. Uh, and Anthony Borelli, always a pleasure, sir. Thanks for having me, as always. Very excited. So welcome, everybody. My name is Joseph Cohen. I'm a professor in the sociology department here at Queens College in the City University of New York, New York City's public university. And this is the next installment of the Queens Podcast Lab Learning Series. It's a series where uh, we explore topics that are of interest to podcasters and other digital content creators. We got a, a great uh, session uh, for uh, all of you today. Uh, but before we begin, I uh, have a couple uh, announcements. Uh, Anthony and Jason, I made you co-hosts. If you can uh, keep your eye on the, uh, on the waiting room in case anybody wants to join, that'd be super. All right, so just a couple items a promo before we get started today. Um, later this month, please join us at the Queen's Podcast Lab lunch, Lunchtime Series. We're going to talk about content creation for faculty. If you're a professor, an academic, a graduate student, or uh, you know, a scholarly creator who's ever thought about dabbling in YouTube or social media podcasts or any type of digital content creation, Please come join us on Friday, September 24th for uh, a discussion. This will be a Zoom-based discussion. Uh, it won't be broadcast to YouTube Live. If you'd like to join, please write me an email at joseph.cohen at qc.cuny.edu. Also on October 1st, those of you who are interested in starting your own podcast or content creation enterprise, might want to join us for Conceiving Content Franchises. This is an instructional seminar where we talk about the uh, decisions that uh, uh, are involved in uh, planning and preparing to launch a uh, new uh, content series or franchise. You can catch the discussion on the Queen's Podcast Lab's YouTube channel. And if you'd like to join us on the Zoom, uh, RSVP to me at Joseph dot cohen at qc dot uh, cuny dot edu uh, join us or please uh, check out our website queenspodcastlive.org slash events for uh, more uh, installments of our series we're going to be running them through the fall we have some more great guests uh, coming up in the works uh, uh, so please join us today uh, we have here let me get so let me stop sharing and bring in the talking heads. Today we have a very, very uh, special uh, 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 special topic, not just because it's a topic that interests so many of the people who come into contact with the lab, but because we get to meet two great people who uh, I'm very happy uh, to have here. Oh, well, now three, because Amy Herzog is here. Amy, wonderful to see you. Thanks for hosting this. I'm so excited. All right, so I would like to introduce you to our first guest. I'm going to start off with Anika Chowdhury. Anika is a uh, production coordinator at DreamWorks, a media studies alumnus, uh, the first intern at the Queen's Podcast Lab. She is partly responsible for everything we've done here and just a real dynamo. Uh, so Anika, welcome. It's great to see you. 
First of all, thank you so much for hosting this. And I am so fangirling of seeing my old professors, Amy Herzog and Mara Einstein. Um, I am just humbled to be here because I was in many of these students' shoes not very long ago, only graduated <laughs> in uh, 2018. And I'm excited to talk about production. For sure. And our second guest is a new addition to the Media Studies faculty, Jamie Cohen is here. Professor Jamie Cohen, uh, welcome. Do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you so much for having me. And thank you for hosting this. This is really an honor to be part of. And I'm really honored to be part of the Queens uh, College uh, faculty. This is a really fun place. And I've been having a good time so far. So thank you so much. Looking forward to the conversation. And thank you again. Awesome. Now, a lot of our, uh, a lot of uh, the people who engage our, our programming, uh, a lot of the students who get involved are media studies students. They are students who have some type of interest in a career in media and some type of passion for uh, a multimedia production. And because so many students are interested in it, and we have people who are part of our group who are new to the university community, freshmen and sophomores who never re really thought about media production as a, as a field uh, to pursue, uh, I thought it would be great to have, you know, just sort of a basic introduction. And we're very lucky to have some media studies professors, uh, Amy Herzog and Mara Einstein. Please feel free to chime in if you have something to add. Uh, we, we, we're, we're happy to hear from you. And so today I just wanted to talk about the basics of this field. What's involved in media production? What makes people, you know, uh, what differentiates a good and a bad producer? If somebody is interested in this kind of stuff, you know, where do you go? How do you get started in a career like that? So let me change the speaker view so we don't have a hundred people. So I want to start off with uh, a question for both uh, Anika and, and, and Jamie. Uh, maybe I'll start off with Jamie because I'm sure you have a, 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 a nice answer prepared in your class. What is multimedia production? Like, what do you guys do? It's a great question. Multimedia happened to be um, the buzzword of the '90s, and it's come back oh. to, to to really be with us now. Um, it is in terms of how it's applied, it really depends. I, just before coming to Queens College, I was a multimedia producer, senior manager of multimedia production for a publishing company. And it was really doing remote media production. And what that really meant, a multimedia producer today to me is more advanced than a new media producer. It's someone who really has a hands-on approach to multiple types of tech, everything from microphones for podcasts to Zoom productions to small form factor camera production. And then really, I think a lot of multimedia production is, if you're not an editor, at least in knowledge of how editing operates. Mm. And that means everything from sound editing, which is smoothing the cuts, to video editing, which is learning how to lay B-roll on top of the primary footage. So it's multimedia is an expansive field and it is kind of nice that it's, re, it's re-emerged in the present, but in a applicable way rather than the, the, the conceptual way of just that was like CD-ROMs. That's not what it is anymore. It is very much a production forward, hands-on pragmatic thing. But I think one of the most important things and to tie in the media studies is that it has to engage with theory pretty much the whole way through because you have to kind of know how the audience interacts with it, wh who you're talking to, what stories you're telling. Anika, on a day-to-day, -day, like how how is the life of a producer experience, right? Like on a high level, we know that they engage in production, but like, what does that mean in terms of nuts and bolts when you check in? Like what, what's your day going to be filled with in this line of work? That's a great question. And I think that really varies depending on what project you're working on and what kind of producer you are, right? There's a line producer and you're dealing with budget and numbers. Are you a creative producer? Um, or as what Jamie was saying, being uh, involved in a project that has multimedia, you're looking at a project from cradle to grave. So it's really great too, to know if you have a background in tech or if you have a background in some of the production positions um, it allows you to look at the big picture, but also understand the day-to-day -day tasks um, that your team, if you're, you're going to be leading a team, that your team is doing. Um, and I think 
part of those those day to day is like you're managing your team, you're checking in with the people that's that are uh, are working for you, and also making sure that you're meeting your day goals, your week goals, your month goals, and if you have a, a year goal. Um, so that's really really important, I think, um, uh, in terms of what what that looks like. Uh, it really really is so versatile. I mean. On the project that I'm working on currently, it's a mixed live action animation show, right? So it there are multiple producers. There's a producer just for live action that deals with um, figuring out how to shoot, and especially like how to shoot during a pandemic. Um, it was it was insane. Um, but I give a lot of kudos to those folks who are producers because of the fact that they have to manage so much and being a good communicator is so important and managing the relationships um, from you know down to the PA to the client, whoever you're answering to, that's so, so important. And so part of what I think is so important about a producer is confidence is key and positivity is key because that really is what your team is going to be feeding off of. Um, and even if like things are on fire, it's your job to make sure that your team feels confident in that we are able to get over whatever this fire is. Um, you know, we've had shoots where during Hurricane Ida, we had a flood during a shoot, you know, so those were things that were immediately needed to be figured out and it's part of the producer's job to to see how you know first of all maintain everyone's safety but um there's just <laughs> there's just no predictability and you could have as much of a plan as you want but there will always be things that won't go your way so being able to be versatile ad adaptable and being able to be resilient is really important so i have this understanding and correct me if i'm wrong so like basically the job of a producer is somewhere between the person who's imagining some vague idea and the actual finished product, the TV show you watch, the, you know, the podcast you listen to or whatever. There's all sorts of, uh, uh, of, of like tasks or jobs that need to get done. You got to corral the actors, you got to work out how things are going to be staged. And then you got to go over the film and it's like, production my understanding and correct me if i'm wrong so is, is it that production is like about all of the tasks that you have to do to organize the performers and the and the footage and whatever you're working on to to take that imagination that idea and, and bring it to reality that script and make it something that can be directly experienced is that what it's about basically or I mean, yeah, this, I once thought of, or I once heard, I was, I wanted to be a producer for a long time. I went to college for TV production and um, I, I ended up producing reality TV shows and like stuff from TV. So it was, it, it did, it was pretty accurate what they were telling me. They said at the time, a producer is someone who's a writer who knows how to edit. And I think that's a really simplified version of exactly what it is. And I didn't really make sense of that until later, which is that you have to work with the storyteller to envision the future. You have to figure it out like it's if it's it's done. You have to know, you have to control the outcome. And so it's a producer is someone who can see or at least have in the imagination of the finished product. So it's the writing to the mm -hmm. editing. And so that's really what they meant. It wasn't a writer who knows how to do it. It was just that they could see the cuts, the footage being cut or the sound being edited on a timeline. They could hear the edits as they were going. They could listen and hear the bites. And I think the biggest takeaway that I learned from a, from a producing standpoint is listening. Like that was like, if you could listen to the, the teammates around you, like if that, if you could get a conceptual comprehensive idea of what somebody's trying to deliver and you could carry that from your mind to the many, many moving parts, like in this many parts, like all the guests, the talent, and then to the crew, to the editors, the assistant editors, if everybody can, if you were there to, to do that, then that's a producer. I mean, Sometimes producers sometimes feel as if they're sometimes too mechanical for that type of thing. But the, at the same time, it's, it is a fairly creative job because you have to see it. It's, it's one of the few people that has the, the imagination, the future in your mind. I'm sure at DreamWorks, this is like way more intense too. It's like the, the, the peak of <laughs> where production kind of at the, where storytelling and producing has really been the, the top level of what we actually watch now. 
Yeah, well, I mean, I definitely can't speak, um, you know, from a producer's uh, standpoint, but as someone, as a coordinator, it's really interesting to see how important um, and how quick creative decisions need to be made. Um, and I think that was the most surprising thing because there are decisions that could affect story, that could affect how someone edits a story, that could affect our storyboards. I mean, there's so many moving parts and they work with a lot of third party vendors. And so a producer really has to have all of those moving components in mind on top of you know what will make the best story and what will engage the audience the most. Uh, so yeah, it's 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 really interesting. I I do feel like that you can always aim to want to be a producer. You know, it's it's funny. I never thought in in my wildest dreams that that's something that I would ever want to do because of how difficult it is. But um, I really think that that's something that you can only know you're you're good at if by trying to do it and whether it's working at somewhere like DreamWorks or making your own project like that's how that's how you know and that's how people I think especially at Queens College like I was able to have that opportunity to make stuff and that's that's where it comes from make your own stuff you know you could make any idea whether and whatever medium that you're comfortable with um, and it was really great in terms of Queens College that we got to have the theory we got to have the video production. We got to have some of the audio production. And thank you to Joad for riding on the wave and, and creating this massive now kind of like ecology of, of podcasting that didn't exist, you know, when I was around. And I just, I, I hope more students take a part of the actual production part um, of it. So what? What skills do you need? Like, let's say a young person is thinking, oh, you know, I, I, I like making videos. I like making my TikToks. I like working on GarageBand. Maybe this is something that I could do professionally. What types of questions should somebody ask themselves to figure out whether or not this is like a gainful, you know, line of work for them or a gainful field for them to pursue? I mean, I think Anika hit it there, which is the passion, the, the, it's, it's less to me, skills are the desire. Like you have to like want to, you know, it's like, if you want to do it, then you do it. Like it's to like, I maybe yeah, Anika, maybe you could go, you go further with this. Cause it's like, I like the way you respond to that with, with this, with how that works. No, I mean, look, I, I came from a, a background where my parents were immigrants and their main focus for me was, you know, get a job that has security. Yeah. And like, since I, the age of five, when I started watching movies and like dancing to Bollywood movies and, and watching American movies and learning English from, from, you know, children's programs like Mr. Rogers and, and Blue's Clues, um, I would say like, I want to be like on TV. And I didn't know what that meant, but that scared the living hell out of them because, <laughs> <laughs> it, on, it, it's just so true. I mean, it's so not a linear path, this entertainment industry, no matter and no matter where you think you're going to end up or or and where you end up are actually very different. Um, I mean, you know, again, like I graduated in 2018, I could never have seen my career path come here. And I think that's part of the beauty about it. But that unpredictability is the reason why I was sort of in my circles told not to pursue it. And I was just constantly rebelling against that. And so when I got to college, I took my first media studies course and I was in the middle of, oh, maybe I should just be a lawyer and I, I love politics. Maybe I should just go into politics. And, and then I kind of saw how, and it's true, like if you have passions, you know, whether it's cooking, whether it's law, whether it's politics, media is this really beautiful, like melting pot of you are able to talk about those topics and engage in them but you don't necessarily have to be the host you could be a part of a production that you know leads that passion somewhere else and so I made up my mind and I realized well I have no technical skills whatsoever like what am I going to do and I think part of that was I was trying to convince myself like if I you know know how to edit if I know how to sound edit um if I can give you know, gain more skills so that I can be more attractive to, to people who will hire me for so-called these jobs, then maybe it'll all work out. 
Um, it was a very naive way of thinking things. And what ended up happening on my journey of taking these classes was I was so excited to, first of all, you know, learn how to hold a camera, learn shots, watch these older, you know, movies that I've never seen that, you know, my parents never watched and seeing them from a different angle and, and understanding how, how people in, in the, from the very beginning were just experimenting with things they didn't know and ended up making some sort of magic. And the best part of Queens College for me was that you didn't need a lot of money or resources the way that you might have been told you needed in a, another school. And so a lot of those classes were just me literally finding classmates that cared about the course. That was big. <laughs> and then after they cared about the course, it was like, okay, well, here's this project. Let's do something cool about it. Like, what are you into? And that collaboration is where I learned so much. And so I feel like, you know, my experience of like knowing nothing and just having passion is just an example of all you need to, I think, succeed in, in this industry, because it will take you so far and take you so many places. And, um, you know, so whether that's collaborating with your friends, whether that's also talking to your teachers, I mean, those, prof I mean, my professors, Amy Herzog, Mara, they've been in the industry, they've written theory, they understand things that I, you know, did not understand. So just talking to them, reaching out to them, asking questions, was really important. I mean, Mara is the reason that I learned about Center for Communication, which is a, I highly recommend uh, as a student to check out. It is a nonprofit industry that basically um, connects students to like the best minds of media and just putting them in the, in the same space. And that was a game changer for me because, you know, just being in the presence of, I don't know, the, the, the president of discovery and hearing, you know, her as a woman explain her journey and being in that same space was like, oh, like, this is attainable, right? Like, that was, that was huge for me. I mean, it, it built my confidence and I hope that virtually it's allowing more people to be able to be in those same rooms, you know, because you're not worrying about costs, you're not worrying about how am I going to get there if you have a job, like, hopefully that I, I hope kind of lowers the barriers, barriers to entry, because it does feel so high, but I hope that sort of answers the question, and I didn't go on a tangent. I, I mean, you might have gone on a tangent, but it was a very productive tangent, and it was great to hear that. I, I noticed I just picked out two things you said earlier and now that are that lead to an amazing story. So earlier you mentioned that you're working with the creator of Blues Clues. And then you just said you partly learned English from watching Blues Clues. I mean, that's an incredible trajectory and the kind of thing I think we hope for so many of our students. And and it and to kind of put it in the terms that I would talk about it with my students. I think that we as college faculty in 2021 have a huge responsibility to help students become creators of the pieces of the media, media environment that so dominate their lives so that they're not just passive consumers, but that they're, they're creators, they're makers, and they know how to do things. And I guess I would be curious from both you and Jamie to hear about what difference that makes when you know how things work from the inside rather than just you know kind of scrolling through the media that we're that we're all dominated by every day i I'll, i guess i'll go um, i have a very interesting take on this i it's i previous to this my last institution i founded a new media degree and it was based on based on create creators like and i think that gen z the upcoming Gen Z and, and Gen Alpha following that there it's a creator world. Everything is just creation. I think um, it isn't, I think transparency is really important to late millennials and Gen Z. I think it's really understanding how the systems work is going to be uh, foremost because I think the it's not about trying to take it over or like see all the th ways in which it's broken, but rather make better material, but make better content. And I, I'm not, I'm not even a big fan of the term content because I think it's better. That's just calling it better stories. But I think when we understand like how to do it, or even just the pieces, we don't have to like, like, we don't have to go out and get like eight, like $80,000 cameras and put them on heavy sticks. 
I've, I've seen stories told with just a simple USB microphone and an iPhone just walking around and telling it. If you could tell those stories, it's your mind. The tool's always been in your mind. And so if you could see how the systems are actually operating, we're, we're at a very fortunate period in the 2020s where finally resolution, that's my audio and resolution have caught up to the brain space of, of creation. And now we, we know that if you know how to get something on YouTube, and you can kind of conceptualize the idea and you have a good set of friends and a good set of professors and the opportunity to experiment, to go off what Anika was saying before, college is where you make mistakes. You know, it's like, it's the time to really experiment. And if you could figure those experiments out, then you could actually like make better stories, like tell better stories. And I think everybody is in a creator space. They just need to give them the, the opportunity and the passion to, to do that. Anthony, did you have a question? Um, I just, I had comments earlier, but we're so far past it, but I did, I did want to say, um, uh, listening to Anika talk about, um, her path and her journey as somebody who also grew up watching Blue's Clues and learning how to, I mean, obviously, uh, English was my first language, but I, I did learn a lot of words and, uh, I learned a lot through television growing up. I was in front of the TV, like my whole life. And, um, learning about culture and context clues through television shows uh, is such a big thing. But what I really uh, wanted to say was that that is really cool that you get to uh, work for DreamWorks and deal with all that. But it's, it's incredible how far you've come from that. Just like, I want to do something in TV. I want to be on TV. That's a mindset that I had a lot as a child. Just I want to do something in entertainment and I didn't know what that meant and sometimes I still don't you know you don't always know even in school even when you're a senior doesn't matter how far in you are you could be into your career what you really want to do what what's gonna fit for you personally and it may take your whole life to find that um but just in media and specifically from my experience even though I'm not out there yet, I found that, uh, like you were saying before, wanting to get a little bit of everything, knowing how to hold a boom, knowing how to uh, hold a camera, just being behind a, uh, being behind the scenes, in front of the scenes, having a little bit of experience in everything, is how you're going to figure out what you really like, what you don't like, and what you want to do. But more importantly, it's going to give you the context and understanding when you're working in a team on in like with other people it's not just good for leadership but it's also good because then you understand where everybody else is coming from it's good for communication and um when i was at my old school my community college they had a decent uh television department in the studio class we each had to create our own show and I had to run my show, pick all the hosts. It was like a little studio show. I did one for Netflix. It was called And Chill. And it was uh, just a few friends of mine who I had sit down and they talked about shows and I'd run clips while they were talking about them, like top five dramas, top five comedies, that kind of thing. And I had somebody on the video effects who would, while they're talking, queue up all of the scenes and they were missing their cues and they were making me angry and I realized as a leader uh how I got frustrated with them but it was my fault because I didn't communicate how I wanted it to the best of my abilities you know you have to be able to be critical of other people and yourself at the same time and understand not everything's going to be as easy or go the way you want it the first time and that's okay because mistakes are going to get made and that's how you learn and that's how you grow so my point is on my little tangent, communication and understanding, knowing where everybody else on your team is coming from and knowing that you're not the only one here looking to find out what they want to do, you know, and making connections with all these other people. Like everybody here right now, it's incredible to see all these people watching right now and that are going to be watching later. Like you're, you are pursuing what you want to do and you're looking for ways to learn more outside of like class and that's awesome. And I, 
thank you for everybody that's here and thank you for the guests as well. Can, can I piggyback on one of, uh, uh, of Anthony's comments here? I'm getting the sense, you know, I, I teach statistics and to some degree, you know, it's, it, it's very, they're very clear and simple operations to do the job correctly. You're like, you do this, then you do this, then you do this. I'm getting the sense from you guys that like, there's a certain chaos to production where it's like, you're just trying to make something happen. And it's like, nobody's quite sure how to do it. You don't know how it works, but it seems a lot less definite than I imagined. Am I wrong about that? Or is it a highly chaotic sort of uh, job? What's the... It's, it's Anthony's right. It's about communication. It, I think being open-minded to change, especially at a coordinator's level. Like that, it's coordination is exactly that. It's somebody who is flexible to change. Like it, things, you, there, everybody wants to envision a perfect project. Everybody does. Everybody who thinks that it's going to go smoothly, but you never know how somebody's mood is on any given day. You never know how, I mean, the pandemic changed a lot of how we're going to be doing production just in general. Uh, I think now we're a lot more open-minded toward the feelings and stressors that come with work in general and labor. And I think if we are at least open-minded to it, we have to be flexible to anything that can shift in real time. I think a producer is the communicator. It's somebody who translates. It is somebody who translates a, a creative idea, whether podcast or visual into uh, skills. So who's doing what and when, and then reversing that and translating upward, backward time, who can help out, who could do certain things and then um, make it work. Because in the end, a lot of production is based on deadlines. So you still have to hit it. You know, you've got to make sure it's there, but it is a lot of figuring out how many different pieces are, are necessary to, to do that. And um, I give a lot of credit to the coordinators out there because I think that's, that's the position that really sits in between the two ends of like making things happen. <laughs> if you don't mind Meg jumping in here, um, you know, this was one of the reasons why many years ago I created a class called the business of media, because I think that there's a, a, a whole swath of jobs that exist that students are just not aware of uh, ac across the media spectrum. So, you know, it's everything like you could be a lawyer in entertainment. You could be an accountant in entertainment. You can be an account executive, you, you know, so you can bring sort of businessy skills um, to the work of doing production. And it was funny listening to this conversation. What it made me think of is the last commercial I ever worked on was one uh, when I was working on Miller Lite. And um, it was one called Football Wives. And when I was working on light, it used to be that it was all the football players, right? And so they decided, okay, we'll do something with the football wives because they wanted to see if they could bring women into drinking more beer. And so while I'm on the shoot, now I'm an account executive, I'm not a producer, but I'm standing next to the producer and I hear one of the wives saying she's pregnant. You can't have a pregnant woman in an alcohol commercial. So this is what I mean, you know, you know, so being able to pivot on the spot is the kind of thing that you need to know how to do as a producer. So of course we shot the, we'd already spent, you know, half a million dollars creating the set because we were down in Florida. We had everybody, you know, all of this kind of stuff. We shot the commercial, we had to shoot it in such a way as to hide the woman who was pregnant. And then we took the film back to New York and recut it so that she was out of the spot. But those are the, you know, the, the thing that you need to know as a producer, totally what Jamie said, it's about writing, it's about communicating, about what Anika said, which oh, I'm so proud of you, I'm like falling over here. Um, said about, um, you know, keeping the happy face on it, making sure everyone stays calm, all of that, and, 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 and knowing that you've got to be thinking down the road, what are the things that could possibly go wrong? And how am I going to be able to pivot if they do? Anthony. Got away from me again. Um, oh, all right. Well, we could go back. We could go back to you. Yeah, I totally uh, forgot what I was going to say. Uh, that it happens. Oh, it's so wonderful to hear. Let, let me let me ask a question. And, 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 and professors uh, 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 Einstein and Herzog, please uh, join in as well as Professor Cohen and uh, Amika. What differentiates an average producer from a truly great producer? 
Like if someone says, listen, I want, I want to really be something special. Like, what is that? How, how do you be excellent? Like what, what, what is it that all of you recognize in the producers? You're like, oh, that, that person's a star. That person's great. What qualities are there? Well, I mean, from, from my perspective, just really quick is positivity. It's, um, I think Anika said it earlier. It's like that you have to kind of carry that. It's, 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 uh, um, if you are able to carry positivity, then it's, it doesn't mean always smiling. It doesn't always mean things aren't bad. It doesn't mean things are going smooth. It just means knowing full well that there's a way of moving it forward. Energy is a big part of producing. And so if you are a, a dark cloud and you're carrying that, it actually is not a really great way to produce. So it's um, producing is a lot of, uh, um, of that type of thought. That's my, my two cents. I was gonna add, um, in addition to the, the pivoting people have been talking about, being able to maintain within that adaptability, a sense of both the, the micro and the macro, um, the, the producers who remember what it's like to be a PA or a production coordinator who um, aren't exploitative, but like have a, have a sense of, um, cause you also then have a sense of what can go wrong if you've like, driven the truck, like all the things that can go wrong that you can um, anticipate that a little bit on the front end, but then not lose a sense of like the bigger picture or producers who are willing to be like, oh, wait a minute, depending on the, the scale of the project and the deadline um, to be like, wait a minute, this isn't the story I thought it was. Um, uh, and being able to kind of pivot um, as a writer or being being able to with a longer form production maybe kind of shift where you're where you're going um, because you're kind of able to think on your feet intuitively about the material something like a podcast especially or other kinds of um, storytelling where you have more wiggle room there but yeah not losing a sight of the, the big picture and being able to pivot on multiple pivot points or axes simultaneously. Can I interject because I, I, it's like answering my own question. I'm so sorry, but I do want to tell uh, a nice anecdote because as, as a creator, who's not a producer, uh, I'll tell you, and what was very special about Anika uh, was that as a creator, I came to rely on her as a co-creator. She would tell me when things aren't working well, she would give me ideas on what to change. And when I was pushing the franchise in a direction that just wasn't working. Anika also knew my audience, also knew the show, also knew the format. And she was just a full, you know, rather than someone who just, you know, uh, combines audio and takes out the vocal ticks and cleans up the sound. She was like a genuine co-creator. And, uh, you know, and when, when she wasn't there, uh, when she had to graduate, you know, it was it was it was it was tough uh, at, at the beginning because you come to rely on her. And so I wonder if that if that's, you know, part of what makes a great, great producer, like somebody who's just really part of the team, like really is someone who the whole team relies on to uh, make something great. I feel like I need to interject real quick with all of those comments that I, I think what's so important about that, our relationship in particular and making the podcast was that you allowed that sort of environment for me to be able to to speak up and say and and give my opinions and be able to collaborate with you and i think that also is i i don't i'm surprised that you don't call yourself a producer because that's part of like what a producer does too because you know when you're working with a team and you're allowing that sort of openness to have that communication um that means that you're being open to you know things that you might think are going really well but from other uh, folks perspectives it actually may not be or they may be seeing things that you're not seeing and i'm just a product of of my professors and their advice and what they have told me too of like how to act during a production or like or explaining you know and in in our case you know 
you allowed me to look up potential guests for the show. Like that wasn't at all what I was supposed to do. I was just supposed to learn audacity, which was free and edit, like edit. That was all my job was. So, I, you know, I, I'm a product of, of that relationship and you allowing me to, to be able to do that. I just wanted to throw that out there. That, that's kind of you to say. And just for those of you listening, by the time Anika left, we were a top 20 social science podcast in the United States. We were a top 25 science podcast in the United States. So Anthony. Yeah. I just want to piggyback off of that a little. Um, for those students who are newer at the school or to the program and want to be more involved, Talk to the professors, get to know everybody in the program, find the people that are the most passionate about it. I like working with Joe so far because he's so excited about everything he's doing. Um, positivity, like Jamie said, is so important. Chemistry is so important. It doesn't matter if you like or know a lot about what you're working on, as long as you have somebody who's going to get you excited to work on it. That's how you learn and grow. You find something that maybe you didn't know a lot about. And now you're excited to find people in that field. And like Anika did, bring them on as a guest for the show. You know, find people, ex like do more than you have to, but don't stretch yourself too thin. And that's why I'm here. I had great, a great high school teacher, Mr. Evison, back in Jersey, who went out of his way to get funding for the program. He, when I was a freshman, he was a year into our television program at my high school. And he built it from the ground up, got grants, funding, everything. His passion to teach it and have people learn it at a younger age, like freshmen to seniors, is the reason I'm here today. And my community college, my professors, Brooke Maya and uh, Jay Varga, also for the radio and television programs and the media programs we had there, were so influential on me. They taught me so much and were so passionate found me internships, found me things to do. You know, when you're in their face, they will give you things to do to get you out of their face and have you working and have you learning. And that's why I'm at Queens now doing everything that I'm doing and putting myself as much into the program and into my field as possible before I get out there. Because one, the more you have on your resume, the more chances you're going to get a job. And two, the more you love what you're doing, the more somebody's going to want to hire you because they see that you want to grow and you want to grow with them or at their company in their program. So definitely. And when you come back to school, like Anika is right now and you see your old professors and you just have so much to say and thank them for, it's nice because they get to see that they had an impact and then you had an impact on everybody else you're talking. Jason, did you have your hand up or any, any responses, any follow-ups? Jason, are you still there? You fell off my screen. I'm here. Sorry. Uh, Am I back on your screen? Yeah, you're back. You're back. Okay. I, I just want to emphasize something or pull out something from what Anika was saying about her working relationship with you. I'm currently teaching a podcasting course in the English department. That's part of our new writing minor. And sometimes people are like, why is that a writing class? And it comes back to what pretty much everybody's been saying. It's about storytelling. Like whether, whether a student's working on a narrative piece or an interview piece or a conversation piece, uh, in each case, what they're trying to do is find the story, right? And the editing is so key in building the story. And I, I would just hypothesize that if Anika had just been like strictly given the task of being an editor and working in audacity and not thinking in a bigger way, she would have learned very little. And it probably would have been really boring too, right? Like the, the technical, you know, the softwares and, and the equipment that you need to tell your story are important, but they only are meaningful in relation to the story. I just, well, I just, I, you know, it's, it's funny that you say that. I think that uh, it's just my passion for, I had interest in seeing it in the bigger picture, but 
I think an editor is super important. And, and sometimes, I mean, maybe not necessarily in my capacity for the sociology podcast, I wasn't really editing this story, but in many ways, the editor can change what this outcome ends up being. And I think that there are so many folks who are technically like uh, really uh, have really great technical skills, may not have maybe necessarily the best people skills, but those people are, are just as, as important, right? So um, I don't know if it would mean less, but in, in my case, I wasn't uh, just as great of an ed audio editor as I hope to be. <laughs> oh. I'll, I'll jump yeah. in here too, just to say, I think editing and post-production is storytelling and is writing, um, uh, and it's just as important in everything else. So maybe if I was reading Jason correctly that, um, it's one thing to like learn how the software works. It's another thing to use that software with inspiration and take that material and shape it, um, shape it into something. And you were able to do that because um, uh, Professor Cohen gave you the space to be a real collaborator and not just um, a passive technician. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, Amy. You really explained what I meant very well. I, I certainly didn't mean to downplay the, the role or the power of an editor, just that editors are part of story creation, right? And and they're doing powerful work. Yeah, they re they really are, and you, you can tell the difference when you work with someone who gives you more than what you brought to it. You know, on a lot of podcasting platforms, there's just a button that says like "produce your podcast," and it just smacks together the two tracks and puts it out. And so, you know, there's, if you're going to be a human doing that and you're going to be better than like a computer that just smashes tracks together and gets, gets rid of the ticks, you know, you have, you have to take part authorship of the well, piece. If you don't, let me add to that. I had a freelance gig for Square and Square was doing this podcast called Talking Squarely. And I was hired as their coordinator and editor. And I had never I'd edited podcasts, but I never edited the way they wanted it to. They were recording hour long recordings, sometimes an hour and a half of five or six guests, but they wanted a 20 minute piece. Like that was their podcast. And it, it was extremely technical editing to where they were cutting. They were basically putting reality bites together, constructing sentences from across the whole timeline. <laughs> and I was like, I didn't really sign up for this, but it was <laughs> It was one of those things where it wasn't, it had less to do with my technical acuity because I I'm, was never really a, an audio person, but more about hearing it, like telling, like t buying, hearing it over and over again and playing with it and, and experimenting and changing the tracks. And it is different than hitting that button that's produced and just smashing all five tracks <laughs> together. It was, it, it was pieces. It was like playing with Legos to the point where it was like, like the Millennium Falcon, not just building like the little ones. Like it, it was really an, an exquisite <laughs> form of producing. And I think that's, if you, if you hear it and you, you give given a good script from somebody or a good story, you, you will do it. I mean, you can make it happen. It's, it's really kind of like fun to do that. And it was fun for me to learn it. And I think that's something that I think everybody's been saying too, is that if you like what you're doing, you're learning at all times. It's just, it's constantly learning and school doesn't really stop. I think that's the big like secret that nobody wants to talk about is that as soon as you're done, it just keeps on going and you're yeah. like, Whoa, that's crazy. But if you didn't have the education, like there'd be no way to have your mind open to learning more. So I think that's, that's an important factor that Anika brought up too, is that what you learn in school sets the, the scaffolding for future learning. So we're coming up on an hour and I wanted to be sure that we would fit in some information to direct students who are joining our community, who don't know about media studies, don't know anything. And they, they want to know, well, if this sounds appealing, they love the idea of creating movies, creating podcasts. What can I study at Queens College? What can I do? And maybe I'll start off with what can like what what's going on at media studies? What do you learn? Like what can what can I learn at media studies if I join the department? Maybe that's a, a good Amy's here. For Take that. it, Amy. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much, there's a lot to learn. And there's brand new stare, and I can keep getting thrown in the deep end. Um, uh, <laughs> so much. I think what I love about our department um, is that we have a lot of different kind of tracks or paths that student, 
students can take, but because we're um, a fairly small program with a, a small number of faculty, we're a little bit scrappy. Um, and that gives students room to uh, room to experiment a little bit. So it's not like maybe some of the bigger programs where you only do production and are kind of locked into a track. And you can certainly do, um, and we have concentrations and tracks or double majors in film studies. We have a brand new uh, program in advertising and marketing, uh, critical advertising and marketing that Mara can tell us about. But um, we really encourage students to experiment um, and hopefully do so in close uh, conversation with a mentor advisor, but kind of try out these different aspects of learning about how media impacts culture, um, how to read films, how to write a screenplay. Um, I'm really excited about the new class on media writing um, that uh, Mira had helped to develop, but that we're now gonna cross list with the new minor in writing in English. Um, um, you can also kind of take these ideas and ideally, um, integrate that with work in uh, sociology and data analytics, um, with uh, writing, with journalism, um, to kind of try out different, uh, different approaches um, or take what you learn from maybe a film history class um, and be exposed to uh, modes of storytelling that you might not have discovered otherwise. Um, I'm a bit more of a historian and I'm really interested in exposing students to like, look at this crazy thing that happened in 1920 and it's completely relevant. Um, now I just had in class, we were talking about um, uh, minstrelsy and blackface and um, we ended up like pivoting from Thomas Edison to like, we spent the whole class talking about Little Nas X and what he was um, doing, um, making those kind of uh, historical leaps and finding something relevant in the present. Um, yeah, I guess uh, I see our program is creating those openings for learning broadly, testing out some of these skills, and then, yeah, knowing you're going to have to keep learning as you go. The other thing I would just jump on there with is um, we there is a, now a certificate in media arts, which is not something that we had, we something that was only started in the last couple of years, because we were finding that students were discovering the production part of the, the department at sort of toward the end of their college careers. Um, and so now there's a series of classes that students can take that they can build their, their production skills um, over a couple of semesters. And uh, you know, because so, some students come to us who are more interested in in broader based understandings of media and its implications and so on. Uh, but there are students who also want to be able to um, to have those hand, more of those hands on kinds of skills. So there is the capability for that. And hopefully, with the new art school, it may not come into fruition quick enough for people who are here. But we're hoping to kind of uh, develop those production classes, again, across uh, departmental lines. And, and also, in addition to that, I know, Jason, you're, uh, you have a, a minor in the English department, and, and you know about the journalism, uh, you know, sort of scene here at Queens College. Can you maybe just uh, tell us a little bit about it? Sure. The writing minor is brand new. We just launched it this semester. And uh, there are three tracks in the writing minor, writing minor. You can choose to study primarily creative writing, professional writing, or theories and practice of, of writing. Uh, although in any of those tracks, you get experience with the others. And we definitely, we are conceiving writing very broadly. So we may have a student who wants to be a novelist and is studying creative writing, but that student is if, if you're an aspiring novelist, you need a web presence, right? So you need to be able to know how to write within a web environment and do web development. Um, maybe you want to branch out or your first book's out and uh, your publisher or your agent is like, I, I think you should make a trailer for this book, right? You need some video production skills. So we're, we think of writing pretty broadly and we really, really recommend students to take media studies courses as part of the writing minor. And there are a few that, that uh, count toward it, including the uh, media writing course that Amy just mentioned. So that's exciting. It's brand new. It's only going to grow. Um, we are bringing in visiting journalists. People may know that currently 
the journalism minor at Queens College is on hiatus. There are various um, there are various conversations about ways to bring it back and slash update it. Um, in the writing minor, we also highly encourage students to do internships. So we've had students do internships with literary agencies, with publishers, uh, with media companies, and with media studies. And with Joe, we've been working with this organization called Media Makers, which is partly funded by the mayor's media office, which gives students tr career training and places them in interviews and gives them, I mean, in internships and then gives them money to do the internships, which is very, very important to us. And then finally, I'm the I'm the faculty advisor for the night news. So um, I work with an amazing group of students, very talented, who it's student run and I'm there to help them along. But we're currently really growing the paper in multimedia directions, the way that all newspapers have been in the last few years. Um, and uh, we have an internship program. We have reporters. We have people on staff. And uh, it's possible to get in involved at just about any of those levels. And then the fi final thing I'll say related to that is the college is, is building in the student union or renovating what used to be WQMC, which was the radio station. And I believe, Amy, Amy, you were the faculty advisor, right? Like more than 15 years okay. ago. Yeah. <laughs> right. And it was great. Well, yeah, it was fantastic. We have such good radio alumni here at Queens. Yeah. I mean, we have people who did the radio club who work in news radio professionally now and are doing great. Um, so that club lapsed for a little while. Um, the college is building studios for various kinds of digital content creation. So you could go in there and make YouTube videos or you could do podcasting. There's going to be recording it's going to be possible to record live music uh, in a main room. And so can, I would encourage can, everybody. To go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say you can stream if you want to have a yeah. game streaming channel. Totally. All sorts of stuff. Yeah. So I would, I, I, I asked people to put your email in the chat if you're interested in that. Anthony's going to be heading up the application for the club. But Jamie made me think. You know, I really don't like the word content either. It just always sounds so, so like corporate desperation. We yeah. need content to fill up our thing or whatever. I wonder if we should change the name. Should it be like the digital storytelling? The digital know. media story? I just always think of, of content farms. And I don't really like the idea of content farms. I like like actual material. It's a, like actual storytelling, actual... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, an important part of producing is knowing who's going to give you money to do it and what name yeah. is going to encourage <laughs> them to give you money. Yeah. So maybe if you say content, they'll give you money and then you oh. very quietly. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a very, that's a very good point. That's a very good point. All right. So maybe What'd you say media creation club or, or yeah. Creators Club of America. <laughs> well, you know what? We'll have to save this for a, a philosophical yeah. session. Uh, before we leave, just a couple of uh, additional items. Um, in addition to all this great uh, formal curricular programming, uh, know that we at the, the Queen's Podcast Lab, we have internships. We're running clubs, this learning seminar. We're doing everything that we can to create a community of creators here at the college. If you're interested in joining us, check us out on our website, queenspodcastlab.org, or you can write to me, joseph.cohen at qc.cuny.edu. Visit us on the web, sign up for our email list, and, and just be around. And hopefully when campus opens up, we'll all be able to get together in real life and, uh, and, and, and create together. Uh, one final word, uh, uh, these free educational, educational resources on digital media creation are brought to you by the state and city of New York. These are your tax dollars at work. Our work creates free public resources, non-commercial scholarly media content, 
uh, original research on content creation, entrepreneurship, and great educational experiences for young New Yorkers who aspire to careers in fields like marketing, media, communication, entertainment, culture, the arts, and information. If you wish to support the kind of work we do, whether it's online learning, our podcasts like the Annex and the QC Pod, or these internships, please visit our site, queenspodcastlab.org, click on Donate, and your tax-deductible donation to our project through the Department of Sociology at Queen's College in the City University of New York not only helps us create these things, but it communicates to our colleagues at the university that people value what we are doing. And with that, let's do the gallery for the final montage of everybody who was here. It was, okay, uh, Jamie and Anika, it was great to learn about media for you. Jamie, we're so excited to have you uh, here on faculty with us. We hope to be seeing you all, all year long and collaborating. Uh, Anika, you're our golden child. We always, we're so, we're so proud of who you are and all you do. We always uh, hold you up as an example for the kids. And it's always just, it. It always makes me so happy to see you and uh, get a reminder of all your success, your well-deserved success. All right. So, you, um, oh, yeah. <laughs> on, on behalf of my colleagues, Jason Tuga and Anthony Borelli, thank you for joining us. Join us in a couple Fridays when we will talk about content creation for faculty. Thank you. Thank you. All right. The